Is receiving communion in the hand a sin? Stick around to find out. Oftentimes, we hear the question of communion in the hand brought up in the Catholic Church, and some people are strongly of the opinion that in and of itself, it's sacrilegious. Now, it must be admitted at the outset, any kind of abuse of the sacrament is sacrilegious, and that can happen with communion on the hand. That's most certainly established. I don't know how anybody could dispute that. But the question is, if the Eucharist is not being abused, so in cases where there's not abuse, is communion in the hand in and of itself a sacrilegious way of receiving Holy Communion? That's the question. And we're not again asking maybe what is the preference that the church should use in its various rites? That's a different question. But once more, we're just asking in and of itself, when it's not being abused, what is um, the uh, answer here on whether or not it's sacrilegious? Is it sacrilegious? Is it not? Uh, is it intrinsically evil? I want to share my screen and show a quote to you from Benedict the Sixteenth that I think that we should really, really consider here. And this is in reference to the Roman Missal. This is, of course, Sumorum uh, Pontificum letter of his holiness to the bishops on the occasion of the apostolic letter motu proprio uh, sumorum pontificum so this is his letter to the bishops he says something interesting here about the roman missal he says there's no contradiction between the two editions of the roman missal so anybody who tries to say that there's this major rupture between the Missal of Paul VI with the Missal of John the 23rd that's not true benedict does not agree there's no essential contradiction between the two here. And he goes on to say, in the history of the liturgy, there is growth and progress, but no rupture. And once again, he wants to say there is no rupture between these two missiles. What earlier generations held as sacred remains sacred and great for us too. And it cannot be, all of a sudden, entirely forbidden, or even considered harmful. Now, in the context, again, this is about the Roman Missal, and uh, the um, Missal of John the Twenty Third, what's often called the Tridentine Mass, though it's not ex exactly accurate. Um, but that 62 Missal has not been entirely forbidden. Uh, the Holy Father still allows for it in certain cases. So it's not entirely forbidden. And it certainly should not be considered harmful. If there are people out there that think the 62 missile is harmful, they are wrong. In the same way that those who think that the missile of Paul VI is harmful, they too are wrong. Um, it's not entirely forbidden, and it certainly shouldn't be considered harmful. But notice what he's saying here, and I want to apply this to communion in the hand. What earlier generations held as sacred remains sacred and great for us too so it's good for us too and it cannot be all of the sudden forbidden or considered harmful so what did previous generations think about communion in the hand what did the first millennium christians for instance think about communion in the hand did they think it was sacred or did they think that it was sacrilegious and if they thought it was sacred then it follows that it's sacred for us too and cannot be in and of itself considered harmful. Now, as far as what they thought, had tip to Eric Ibarra, he pointed out the other day on his social media an article written by Elizabeth Klein with a lot of the quotes from the early church about communion in the hand. Very, very concise article, very helpful, quotes all primary sources here, which we're going to look at in a moment. But the article is entitled Christian, Early Christian Communion in the Hand, again by Elizabeth Klein at Church Life Journal. Very accessible, and once more, primary sources are being quoted here. Very, very useful. So you can go down and see the primary sources from the Church Fathers here. Now, let's briefly look at the article and see what they said. <clears throat> 
Well, the author of the article says, As a scholar of the early church, I was surprised to learn that the practice of communion in the hand was such a hotly debated topic. So then they uh, put forward this article. And they say, in North Africa, the practice is mentioned by Tertullian. And this, this is the practice of communion in the hand. And the uh, author says, receiving communion in the hand was the common practice of the church in both East and West for the first 800 years of Christianity. And it was certainly considered reverent by the fathers. So if that is true, once more, keep in mind what earlier generations held as sacred, this apostolic practice of administering communion on the hand that was so prevalent in the church for 800 years between East and West, they considered it sacred. If they considered it sacred, it remains sacred for us. It cannot be entirely forbidden or even considered harmful. They say, in North Africa, the practice is mentioned by Tertullian, and they give you a citation. Cyprian, they give you a citation. Augustine, they give you a citation. For all these, they're giving you citations. Cyril of Alexandria, John of Climacus. In Jerusalem, we have the mystagogical catechesis of Cyril of Alexandria, or perhaps his successor, John. It's a little uncertain whether or not Cyril himself wrote this lecture. Um, or this catechetical uh, reference, or was it John, perhaps, his successor? Either way, it's uh, within that time period in Jerusalem. In Syria, what we now call Turkey, it is witnessed by Basil the Great, Chrysostom, Theodore of Mopsuestia, John of Damascene, and the Council of Constantinople in Trullo, which is a very curious case. In the East, what we would now call the Middle East, East Syria, we have evidence from Ephraim the Syrian, and Norsai, in the far-flung regions of the Empire of Gaul, that's modern-day France, we have the witness of Caesarius of Arles and the Council of Auxerre. And in England, we have the Venerable Bede. Liturgical evidence from Rome is always sparser than one, sparser than one would like, says the author, but Eusebius preserves a mention of communion in the hand in a letter written from Dionysius of Alexandria to Sixtus I, Bishop of Rome, and in a letter of Cornelius, Bishop of Rome. And again, they're giving citations here. Moreover, an illuminated gospel, the Rosano Gospels, depicts the Last Supper as a communion line where the disciples received in cup hands while bowed. This list is by no means exhaustive, so there's plenty more here. And it would be tedious to cite all of the references as a catalog, but let, let us turn to a few of them, they say. And here's, by the way, um, what they were referencing. And lest somebody say, ah, but it was done differently. It was always done on a cloth. That's actually not true. In some very rare cases, for a very minor period of time, the best that I can tell, women, in once again, a very select location, women were required to receive communion uh, on the cloth in their hand, but not men. Uh, so that, that practice doesn't seem to be very pervasive of receiving on the hand with a cloth on your hand. Uh, it inevitably comes up, however. People will try to say it was different, and wasn't that different. Um, and you'll always see these spurious quotes floating around on the internet. Many of them are spurious, uh, where people will quote lists of communion on the tongue and uh, quotes allegedly forbidding communion on the hand. You often notice that they don't really give you complete citations. Um, and when you start trying to track down some of those uh, citations, you'll, you'll find out how problematic they are. But they're floating around online, as opposed to the ones that this author quotes, which you can uh, easily verify. They say, it is clear that this mode of reception was considered reverent and to be carried about in a reverent manner. Cyril of Jerusalem and Theodore of Mopsuestia liken the practice to that of receiving a king. Both of them note the med method of reception was in joined hands. Cyril says, or his successor, one of the two, coming up to receive, therefore, do not approach with your wrists extended or your fingers splayed, but making your left hand a throne for the right, for it is about to receive a king, 
and cupping your palm, so receive the body of Christ and answer amen. There's curious other quotes where you can notice where they also take the Eucharist and mark their eyes with it, their lips with it. So they'll take the Eucharist and they will rub it on their face and rub it on their lips. And um, certainly not a practice that we do today, but uh, it's it's pretty curious that they uh, so in, in some parts had that practice. Here's what Theodore says. To receive the sacrament which is given, a person stretches out his right hand, and under it he places the left hand. And this he shows a great fear. And since the hand that is stretched out holds a higher rank, it is the one that is extended for receiving the body of the king. And the other hand bears and brings its sister hand while not thinking that it is playing the role of a servant, as it is equal with it in honor, on account of the bread of the king which is about to be borne by it. When the priest gives it, he says, the body of Christ. He then teaches you by this word not to look at that which is visible, but the picture in your mind by nature, or in your mind, the nature of this oblation, which by the coming of the Holy Spirit is the body of Christ. You should thus draw near with great awe and love according to the greatness of that which is given, with awe because of the greatness of his honor, and with love because of its grace. This is the reason why you say after him, Amen. There is a couple more here. Check out this quote from, again, Trullo, uh, which some consider to be part of the Six Ecumenical Council. It was to an extent received in the West, but not entirely. Uh, those canons that conflicted with some Roman practices weren't necessarily entirely received in the West. Uh, but notice this practice here in the East. Notice what this canon says. It says, The great and divine ap apostle Paul with loud voice calls man created in the image of God, the body and temple of Christ, excelling therefore every sensible creature, he who by the saving passion has attained to the celestial dignity, eating and drinking Christ, is fitted in all respects for eternal life sanctifying his soul and body by the participation of divine grace. Wherefore, if anyone wishes to be a participator of the immaculate body of the time of the synaxis, that's the liturgy, and to offer himself for the communion, let him draw near, arranging his hands in the form of a cross, and so let him receive the communion of grace. But such as, instead of their hands, make vessels of gold, or other materials for the reception of the divine gift, and by these receive the immaculate communion, we by no means allow to come as preferring inanimate and inferior matter to the image of God. This is a curious canon, because what they're saying is this. They're saying, you as a human are made in the image of God. And so you, it is much more fitting that you would receive Christ on your hand rather than, than on some inanimate matter made of gold, a vessel of gold. Because that gold is not made in the image of God, but you are made in the image of God. So it's much more fitting that you would receive on your hand than on some kind of precious metal that isn't made in the image of God. So again, not only did they think communion in the hand was allowed, they're saying it's actually preferred because you're made in the image of God. So those who talk about how, how dare you bring your dirty paws, as we saw from Taylor Marshall, your dirty hands here to the Holy Eucharist. Yeah, you know, that wasn't really the view of the early Christians. They, they thought otherwise. They didn't think that your hands were just dirty and you couldn't receive. They thought, no, you're made in the image of God. And so how dare you receive it on something made of gold that's not made in God's image? That's basically uh, what they would have said in response to that. Now, obviously, <clears throat> in both East and West, the practice of receiving in a different method or manner developed. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. I'm not knocking it. I actually think it's understandable why communion on the tongue developed in the West and why in the East the liturgical spoon was used. I think it's understandable. But what we can't do is say that this method is wrong 
or in and of itself sacrilegious because once again, as Benedict says, what earlier generations held as sacred remains sacred and great for us too and cannot be considered harmful. One more quote here that I want you to take a look at. Obviously, you should go to this um, website and read the entire article. I'll, I'll include it in the link. But note this by St. Augustine. Someone might say that the Eucharist should not be received daily. Why? Because, he says, one should choose the days on which he, one lives with more purity and self-control in order to approach so great a sacrament worthily. For one who eats unworthily eats and drinks to his own condemnation. Another will say the opposite of that. He'll say, on the contrary, if the wound of sin and the attack of the disease is in fact so great that such medicines need to be postponed, one ought to be removed from the altar by the authority of the bishop in order to do penance, and one ought to be reconciled by that same authority. For this is what it is to receive unworthily. If one receives at that time when he ought to be doing penance. In other words, you know, if 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 th what they're doing is so bad, they should be basically disciplined by the bishop and shouldn't receive until the bishop says something. So one extreme is going to say, look, you shouldn't be receiving the Eucharist often because you know, sometimes you're struggling with sin. And uh, another person is going to say, look, you should just receive communion unless you're, you're disciplined by the bishop. He says this, but one should not by his own judgment abstain from or return to communion as he pleases. On the other hand, if the sins are not so great that a person should be judged to deserve excommunication, he ought not to withdraw from the daily medicine of the Lord's body. It's a curious consideration. And, and by the way, Augustine does testify to communion in the hand in his day. He also testifies to communion for infants in his day in the West. Um, since it was the practice of the West until pretty late, actually, and in, into the second millennium, uh, the West was communicating infants. Um, but a lot of the changes that happened in the West with... Um, uh, Holy Communion occurred towards the end of the first millennium and also in the early second millennium. But anyways, I'm going to include a link to this because I want you to go and read the rest of it. Very helpful article. And once again, have tip to Eric Ibarra for posting that on his social media and alerting us to it. Um, and like I said, go and chase down, track down the primary sources that they give there at the beginning. They cite over 19 of them, and it's certainly not exhaustive. Certainly go and check it out. I think you'll find it very, very beneficial to answering this question. Well, once again, thank you all for watching this show. Hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, and check me out at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology if you want to support me. Hey friends, do you want others to discover why the Catholic Church is the church that Jesus established? And do you want to help people make sense of all the confusion in the Catholic Church today? Help contribute to this mission by supporting Reason and Theology at patreon.com forward slash reason and theology. By doing so, you'll also get access to exclusive content for patrons only. Also, if you want to deepen your faith, there are free ebooks and even courses that you can sign up for by visiting reason.podia.com.